everyone welcome back to my channel welcome back to another vlogmas video today i wanted to talk about my first year as a casa volunteer so today it has been exactly one year since my very first interest meeting to join CASA, which is a program that helps kids in foster care. So I thought now would be a good time to reflect on my first year doing this CASA program and to also let you guys know about it because I think that this is an amazing organization that needs more volunteers and as it's coming to the end of the year and you're thinking about how you want to spend your time in the new year, maybe think about joining a CASA organization near you if this sounds like something you would be interested in. I think there are so many people who would be good at this and enjoy doing this, they just don't know it's out there. So that's kind of the force of this video is to reflect on my first year but also share with you guys about this organization so you can learn about it and think about joining. So CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates and the way I like to describe it to people is that it's kind of a common combination between like big brother big sister type of thing where like you partner up with a kid you get to know them you spend time with them you do fun things with them you just like make them feel special and appreciated but then the other side of it which is like the legal side is that as their court appointed advocate you have the court appointed right to review everything related to this child so you can review all of their educational records their medical records their therapy reports you meet with their parents their foster parents their lawyers their doctors you know everyone involved in their life their social work team and the idea is that because when a lot of kids are in foster care they shuffle around a lot, they get moved to a lot of different homes, they often change schools, they don't always have the same lawyer working with them through the duration of their case. So they go through a lot of trauma and they go through a lot of changes in this period, especially because they are no longer home with their biological family. And that's really traumatic for children. So in order to help with that, having one person who's consistent in their life, like no matter what else is changing in their life, you're still part of their life as their advocate. You see them once a month at least, you spend time with them, you get to know them, and you help ensure that nothing in their case gets left behind or falls through the cracks. So I actually heard about CASA probably like more than five years ago, and I've really wanted to join and be involved in this program for years and years, but usually CASA requires you to dedicate at least two years of service to the program because that's kind of the average length that a child is in foster care. So they want you to be there for two years because like I said, they want you to be with the kid for the entire time that they're in care. And in the past, I've never really been in a situation where I was 100% sure that I was going to stay in the same area or the same town or whatever for more than two years. So now when I moved to Philadelphia and I knew I was going to be here for a while, I was like, great, this is the perfect time when I can join CASA. So I went on their website and I found my local organization. CASA is all over the country, so there is one local here in Philadelphia. And I learned that there's about 4,000 children in foster care in Philadelphia, and there's only about 400 CASAs. So, you know, right, only about 10% of kids in care get a CASA. And they try to pair CASAs up with kids that have like a more extreme or more serious need. Um, in the case that I'm working on, I'm actually the CASA and the EDM, which stands for Educational Decision Maker. So sometimes you'll be both. Um, those are for cases where the child has nobody else in their life who can make educational decisions for them or has volunteered to do that. So you kind of become almost like their parent, like you sign forms for them, you help create their IEP, all of that type of stuff. So in an educational role, you have a more active role. But as a CASA, you actually only need to dedicate one time a month that you visit the child. You can visit them more, you can talk to them on the phone, like you can interact with them more often, but minimum you see them once a month. And then you also go to court every three months. I don't know if that's the same in every state, but in Philadelphia, the court hearings are every three months. So once a quarter, I go to court with my CASA supervisor, and usually at the court hearing, the biological parents will be there, the lawyers are all there, the social work team, and you know, whoever else is involved in the case for that day. And prior to the court hearing, I write a report to the judge to kind of go over like, what's going on with the child lately? How are they doing? What's going on in school? How's their health? Are they in a stable foster home? Do they need anything? Like, do they need clothing? How are they reacting to their visits with their family? Like anything going on with the child, you write in a report that goes to the judge. And that really helps the judge get a more well-rounded view of what's going on with the kid. Because often in the court cases, like, you know, the parents are arguing for their point of view and the social work team is arguing their point of view, but 
it's not always that somebody is there who like intimately deeply knows the child and what they want and how they're doing and what they need so being a CASA is really important for the outcome of these cases sometimes because if you find out from a kid that something's going on that needs to be addressed you can tell that to the judge and that can be addressed and somebody else might not know that. So in order to become a CASA, again, at least in the state of Pennsylvania, I don't know if it's the same everywhere, but I think it is a very similar thing. You have to do 30 hours of training before you can be paired up with a kid. So your very first step is that you attend an intro meeting. A lot of these meetings are like online via Zoom. Um, sometimes I think they are in person now that COVID is kind of winding down and people are boosted and everything. But the meeting that I did last year was an online Zoom meeting where they kind of just go over like some of the things I just told you and explain like how the program works. And then if you're still interested, you can sign up for a training class. So the class that I did, it was two days a week and it was three hour sessions and they were all within one month. So it was like a lot of training in one month, six hours of training a week. And the training goes over all sorts of different topics that you need to be aware of. Cause this is all prior to you being paired up with any child. Like this is more of just like a general run through of issues that could come up, things that you need to know about. You have to be a mandated reporter. So you have to do a training about that. You have to have an FBI fingerprint background check to make sure that you have no history of abusing kids or you know any sort of crimes related to children. Obviously, you can't work with kids if you have a history like that. So they do check that very thoroughly. And then in the training classes, they kind of go over all sorts of different topics. So they go over like signs of abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, the difference between poverty and neglect, which I found really interesting. We did a really interesting exercise where you see an image of a home that looks like maybe this family is not in the best shape and there's like some things wrong in the picture but the point of the exercise is to pick out what is right in this picture like what's going well so something that they kind of teach you to look for is like what is going well in this family like what are the points of strength for the biological parents you know obviously you need to know like what happened for them to lose their kids in the first place but you also want to look at it as like what's going well, like how can we help, how can we make this situation even better. We talk about the fact that the goal for all of these cases in the beginning is usually reunification, um, depending on what's happened. Obviously, if there's some sort of actual crime that's been committed against a child, that's a different situation. There are criminal proceedings that cover some of that stuff, but most of the time kids are actually going into foster care because of situations related to poverty or neglect and that's a very different thing than like active abuse so we talked a lot about how to identify the differences between those things and how to proceed forward with the case depending on what's going on for that child one thing we talked about in the training and i actually got into what was not supposed to be an argument but turned into like a pretty big argument with the trainer at least in my specific situation like in my class because we talked about lgbtq plus issues because some kids that are in care of course are gay or trans and we need to help those kids too and like make sure that we know how to handle their case with the delicacy it requires especially if the child's family or foster family or something is not okay with that the thing that the argument ended up being about was we were talking about trans kids in foster care, especially like teenagers and stuff, who are interested in changing their name, whether it's just like the name that they use or if they want to legally change their name. And I got into this whole thing with the instructor of the class because she was using a kid as an example, a trans kid that she had worked with in the past, and she kept saying their dead name in order to like explain the process of like changing your name which like i think at the core of it like that's good that's important for us to know like legally what's required and how to help somebody if they want to change their name but like she just kept saying the dead name over and over and over again and initially i just wrote in like our little chat box in the class because i didn't want to interrupt the class i was just like hey like do you mind not using the dead name like you know i would appreciate that something like that and she like stopped the entire class to be like, sorry, what, why? And like arguing with me about dead naming trans kids. And I was just like, can we not do this? So that was something I was very frustrated about with the training is I think the portion they did on 
LGBTQ plus issues was really lacking. I think that the trainer was not as informed as they should have been about those issues. But again, that was just one person in my particular case. That's definitely not across the board. I think the written materials they gave us about LGBTQ plus issues were actually very good. The other thing that we talked about a lot in training that I thought was helpful was issues of racism. So for example, in the city of Philadelphia, and of course this is different depending where you are, the population in Philadelphia breaks down like around 40 something percent of people are black and 40 something percent of people are white. So it's a relatively similar percentage of white and black in the city, but 70 percent of kids that are in foster care in Philadelphia are black. So obviously there's a different way that people react and report what they perceive as abuse or neglect against white families than black families. And that's true of other ethnicities as well. Like there's some studies that we looked at about how like all people of all ethnicities experience like child abuse or neglect at a similar rate. Like it has nothing to do with ethnicity, but it gets more often reported against people of color. And people of color are also more likely to lose their kids in the foster care system than white families. So I thought that was really important to talk about and know about, especially in a city with such high diversity and like, an overinflated number of children in the system who are black. We also talked a lot about, you know, how to interact with children or with families who might come from a different culture than yours. So for example, the way people interact with their family, the way that they discipline their children, it might not be the same that you're used to in your culture, but other cultures do things in a different way. And just because something is different doesn't mean it's abusive. So you always have to be looking at everything with a really like nuanced perspective to figure out what's really going on. So those were some of the things we covered in training. Like I said, it's 30 hours of training. So there's a lot of topics that we go over. And once you complete your training, you're able to be partnered with a child. So I work with a child in Philadelphia. I'm not allowed to really talk about her in detail, but she's an elementary school age girl that I've been working with. I really enjoy working with her. I've seen her make huge improvements in the time that I've known her, and I have really high hopes for her. We're not quite sure yet what the outcome of her case is going to be, but I'm just there to be a helping hand, to make sure I'm listening to her and I know how she's doing, and report that back to the appropriate parties. So, like I said, I can't go too much into detail about her specifically, but she is doing a lot better, and I think that she is really benefiting from having me as part of her case. I think that CASA is a really great way for people to get get involved in the child welfare system without having to be a lawyer or a social worker or like have a certain degree or a certain education. Like if you are interested in this field and you want to do something to help, but you don't want to make it your entire career, this is a really, really good way to get involved, be super impactful to kids that need help, but also maintain, you know, your regular career, your regular life. It really doesn't take that much time. Like I said, it's one visit with the kid at least once a month. You can do more if you'd like to. And then it's one court date every three months and you have to write a report ahead of the court date, which usually takes me about 30 minutes to do. So it's not a big time commitment. The training is a lot up front, but once you're trained, you have to do six hours of training a year to keep your membership active. So it is a really small time commitment for something that makes a huge, huge impact in a child's life. So I really encourage anyone, if this sounds interesting, to you if you've heard of it before and you're thinking about it definitely look into it at least attend an information session in your area and see what you think see if this might be a fit for you i think it's a really great way for people to get involved and like i said at the beginning i think that there's a lot more people who would enjoy doing this but they just don't know about it casa is all over the country in most towns and cities there are local chapters unfortunately there are foster kids everywhere and they all need help and they all could benefit from a person like this in their life so i just wanted to share that with you guys today i've been reflecting about my first year in CASA, how my kid is doing, how she's improved, and I just wanted to share with you guys so if you want to join, you have the opportunity to learn a little bit more. So I will link in the description the National CASA website so you can find your local chapter, and if you sign up, let me know. I would love to know that more people are joining CASA to help kids out. And until next time, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in my next video. Bye!